Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Thank you for coming to join with one another, brothers and sisters in Christ, to worship and celebrate our great and mighty God and our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know that God has a blessing for us as we come together. If you're here in the building or if you're watching us on the video, uh, we welcome you and we know that God has a blessing for you. Uh, again, if we come with open hearts, open minds, and open spirits, expecting to meet with God, we know for sure he said he would be here and he's willing to meet with us. So we do indeed come with expectation and with thanksgiving in our hearts for this privilege. As I've mentioned each Sunday, masks are not required, but they are recommended, as you know, by our province, especially for those who've not been fully vaccinated for at least two weeks. And so we do welcome you in and hope that you feel safe and comfortable here as we give God the grace, the praise for this opportunity to, to come together in this way. Let's ask God's blessing upon our meeting. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and joy that is ours to come together in your name, Father, to come together in this building, to come together by your Spirit through this video. Father, we know that by your Spirit you minister to our spirit and you prepare us for worship. Lord, uh, we, we want this to be more than just a physical activity, but something that is happening deep in our spirit. And above all, Lord, our desire is that certainly we would be blessed, but that you would be glorified and lifted up because you've said that if you will be lifted up, you'll draw all people unto you. Father, draw us to you, we pray, in this time. May every word spoken or sung be to your glory and empowered by your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Welcome on this beautiful Sunday morning. And um, as it says in the scriptures, I invite you to enter his courts with thanksgiving and his gates with praise. Um, we know that God is here, not because... This building is anything special, but because of the people here, because we are the temple. And wherever God's temple is, that's where his spirit is. So let's rejoice knowing that God is here through his spirit because of Jesus Christ. Oh, 
When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow tries to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love Shame no longer has a place to hide I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand power that can break off every chain There's power that can empty out a grave There's power that can save There's power in your name Power in your name There's power that can break off every chain faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design in the lives of those who prove his faithfulness who walk by faith and not by sight by faith our fathers roam the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts of a holy city built by God's own hand a place where peace and justice reign we will stand as children of promise we will fit our eyes on him our souls reward till the race is finished and the work is done we'll walk by faith and not by sight by faith the 
prophets of day. When the longed for Messiah would appear, with the power to break the chains of sin and death, and rise triumphant from the The church was called to go. In the power of the Spirit to the lost, to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner. by faith and not by sight. I think this mountain shall be moved, and the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible.
when I cannot stand up follow you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand up follow you. Jesus, you're my hope and we thank you for being all that we need. And when we try to cling to the things of this world, help us to see how empty they are compared with you. And Lord, if we're in any way feeling self-sufficient, Or that we can walk in our own strength. Lord, I ask that you would show us how much we need you. Lord, you're our only salvation, our only hope. And that's why we're here. That's why we, we sing these songs and we cry out to you. Lord, we need you every day. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh, God, how I Good morning. Can you hear me? <laughs> Not quite yet? All right, there we go. I want to say that we have completed two weeks of camp, and it's been great. And um, I'm just so thankful for all the campers that, who came, and new relationships to build, and the fun that we had, and learning about God. But I also want to say that it didn't happen in a vacuum, and that we are so very grateful for everybody who prayed for the camp, and who sent their kids, we want to say thank you to Honora and Helen, who were our snack makers. They uh, made us penguins and snails and little snakes out of food. They were very fun. And we want to say thank you also to Leah and Elijah, Ethan and Luke, Daniel, Imogen, Adelia, and Olivia, who came as helpers and helped us run the camp. And we want to say thank you to John for supplying games personal games he had made himself, and those are very fun. And especially to Patty for bringing Flora, her uh, very large, very hairy dog, to uh, camp. The kids loved her, and she was so gentle and kind and sweet, and we really enjoyed her visit for our animal week. Yes, we were sowing seeds and learning about God. I've been thinking, we studied a lot about the animals. We learned a lot about animals, and you know, I was thinking about mosquitoes. And I'm a little bit jealous of my dog because he doesn't get mosquito bites, whereas, you know, I can end up looking like something. <laughs> they love me. I'm a little sweet, right? No. <laughs> That's what I tell myself. 
Daniel ends up looking like a pin cushion. And uh, I always wondered, why did God have to make mosquitoes? So annoying, right? Yeah, I know. Well, I think he had a good reason. I don't know that I understand all the reasons. But the first mosquitoes didn't suck blood, did they? In a perfect creation, there probably was no blood sucking, no deadly diseases transmitted through mosquito bites like yellow fever and malaria. God said everything he made was very good. After the fall, however, mosquitoes like us and all of creation fell from perfection, just like so many other pests and poisons and parasites and problems, right? All creation groans, waiting until God will remake the new heavens and the new earth like he promised. Before Genesis 3, mosquitoes were busy taking nectar from flowers to fruit. And out of the 3,500 mosquitoes, species that there are, only a few hundred really bother us. I had no idea there were even that many types of mosquitoes. Yeah. Mosquitoes are an important link in the food chain. The larvae keep the, they filter and clean cloudy water. Fish, tadpoles, and dragonfly nymphs feed on them. Birds, bats, and spiders eat the adult mosquitoes, and they pollinate plants. So God had a purpose for them, right? That, that helps me feel a little bit better. But you know what? Mosquitoes can teach us. Scientists have, Japanese scientists have been studying mosquitoes, and they were wondering, how do they bite without getting swatted? Because I would like to know that too, wouldn't you? Like if you felt it, you'd whack it, right? Yeah. Well, the stingers, they checked us out are like a mini elephant's trunk. And the inside sucks the blood, and the outside is the needle part. So the outside, you would think, would be very thin and fine, but no, it's actually jagged, and then there's fewer points of contact, so it can go in. But it doesn't just go straight in, it goes in like a jackhammer. So it goes really fast. <laughs> mini jackhammer on your arm. 15 cycles per second, and each time it goes just a little bit deeper, so you don't actually feel it going in. And then, that was pretty cool, but instead of going straight down, like when we, give our, we get a needle, right? We've all had the jab. It goes in at an angle, and so even less contact. They're so smart. Did they get smart all by themselves? No, God designed them to do it so that they could be really efficient at taking our blood. But, yeah, I know. But, but they're important, right? And they have a job to do, and we can learn from them. So maybe next time you get your jab, it will be a painless needle because the scientists will be using the same design that they learned from the mosquito. I hope so. Get the jab anyway, even if it hurts a little bit. Okay, <laughs> let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good, and you designed a beautiful world. We're so sorry we messed it up. Please be with us and help us to take care of the creation and the animals that you have made for us to enjoy and to learn from and to know you better through. We thank you for the mosquitoes, and we thank you for the things that you teach us through even a mosquito. I thank you for all the children who came to camp. I pray that they'll remember the things that they learned and the things that will help them to grow closer to you. We love you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Roger. And worship team, thank you, Sandra. I still haven't gotten over her telling us that they had escargot at uh, uh, camp. You know what escargot is, right? It's snails. She said they had snails, and I love escargot. I wish I'd have come that day. You didn't tell me. Well, maybe they weren't made quite that way, possibly. Right? I know they had a wonderful time, and as I mentioned last week, how wonderful it was to hear young voices and hear the children running about here in the building once again, a little bit of life having returned, and I know that God did something special there for sure. This time we're going to ask the blessing on our offering, and of course we're receiving our offering a little differently than we have in the past. There is a box there at the back that you can drop your offering in if you'd like. You can continue to mail it in, drop it through the mail slot, or use e-transfer, and if you'd like to do that, I can give you information on that. Let us pray. Our dear God and Father, thank you for your many blessings. Thank you, Father, 
for how you provide for our needs and how we know that we live and walk in you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity now to glorify your name by participating in your ministry through our financial giving. Bless these gifts, we pray, to your glory and kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. During our pastoral prayer time throughout August, we've been praying specifically for our church and churches everywhere as we get back and try to get our ministries up and going and that kind of thing. So we've been focusing on different avenues of needs uh, within the church and different ones have been leading us in those. So Patty has agreed today to come and she's going to read two different prayer themes, two scriptures, and also share two prayers with us. So thank you, Patty, for sharing and leading us in that this morning. Pray that the church will boldly share Jesus, the only way and only hope. Peter said, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people, and we must be saved by it. Acts 4, verse 12. Let us pray. Saviour, fill us with your spirit to boldly proclaim there is salvation in no one else but you. Through our church, shout your name. Lift up your name for all to hear and all to see. Jesus, your name is above all names. Only you can save. Keep us committed to sharing your salvation and your beautiful, wonderful, life-changing, eternity-altering name. Compel us to boldly speak your name. Because of your name and in your name we pray. Amen. Pray for the church's dedication and perseverance to press believers on to maturity in discipleship. Paul, we proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Let us pray. Jesus, we confess as a church that we want to know you more. We commit to prioritize discipleship, to actively participate in the study of God's word, personally and corporately. God, come alongside us and mold and make us to become more like Jesus. May our leaders labor and strive to present this body mature in Christ. Help us to grow. Give us a passion and zeal for the Bible and prayer. Feed us. Strengthen us and move us when necessary so that we are men and women of faith, full of grace and truth. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Patty. Those are beautiful prayers and good thoughts as we begin a new church year. I'm willing to guess that 
Most of us here in the building and here on the video are familiar to some degree with King Solomon. You remember King Solomon in the Bible? King Solomon, who turned out to be the last uh, king or ruler of a united Israel. King Solomon, who was well known to today for his great wisdom. And King Solomon, who's also known in his day for his unprecedented wealth. In 1 Kings chapter 12, we read the story of someone by the name of the Queen of Sheba, who herself, I guess, was wealthy and famous. But she'd heard of Solomon's reputation. and She had to visit. And when she did, she said, But I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report I heard. Solomon was, was wealthy beyond measure. But the measure of his wealth is suggested in a number of ways throughout the Old Testament. And in this same chapter, we read that among other things, he had 400 shields fashioned out of pure gold and displayed in one of his palaces. In verses 16 and 17, King Solomon made, excuse me, 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 shekels of gold went into each shield. He also made 300 small shields of hammered gold with three miners of gold in each shield. Then the king put them in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. Solomon was wealthy beyond our imagination. But if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you maybe know how the story goes. That actually, this great wealth for Solomon, this great time for Israel, was the beginning of the end. Soon the nation would begin to fall apart. And as they continued generation after generation, turning their backs on the one true God, their wealth began to fade away. So we read just in the 14th chapter of 1 Kings, that about 60 years later, the pagan king of Egypt would, would raid Solomon's temples and palaces and carry away these golden shields and the people would replace them with inferior bronze shields. Now what does this have to do with our sermon this morning? Obviously we're talking here about physical shields for physical battle. Most of us, thank goodness, will never be called into a physical battle. But all of us, every day, I believe, find ourselves in a spiritual battle. So I want us this morning to think about spiritual shields. The, the Bible talks a lot about spiritual battle. The Apostle Paul, as you may know, speaks much about being prepared for the spiritual battles that we face in life. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, that's our text this morning, 1 Corinthians 16 verses 13 and 14, we see here where the Apostle Paul suggests five spiritual, uh, five spiritual shields. Well, I have it here somewhere. Didn't come up as well as I'd hoped. Did it? Do you want to advance that? There it is. Five spiritual shields shields of gold. We're going to talk about those golden shields and then make a word or two, a comment or two on the bronze shields of the world. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14, Paul is, as I said, preparing us for spiritual battle. And he suggests five shields. The first one is this. This doesn't seem to be working for me. So I'll get you to advance it. Thank you, Bella. Be on your guard. Be on your guard. Be vigilant. Be watchful. Be alert. To what? What should we be on, a, on our guard about? Well, the Bible has a lot to say about that. For example, we are to be on our guard against temptation. Now, what do we mean by temptation? We use that word a lot. We kind of throw it around. Well, there's a number of ways of looking at temptation. We can't consider them all. But I remember... The story you remember, I'm sure, of Jesus going with his disciples to the Mount of Olives to pray to the garden, to pray before he was uh, arrested and taken to the cross. And to his disciples, Jesus said, 
Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The word he uses there means test to prove. A test to prove. So when the Bible is speaking of temptation, when Paul is speaking of temptation, oft, often it refers to those tests that come into our lives to prove the authenticity and the strength of our faith. For the twelve in this particular moment, it was a test of loyalty to their Lord and their Master. Would they stay up all night and pray with Him? They failed miserably, didn't they? Because they fell asleep at the wheel. They failed to heed Jesus' words to bolster their spirit, to build up their faith through prayer and contemplation, and they failed the test. Be on your guard, be vigilant, be watchful, be alert to temptation. When test comes, will you be ready? The Bible also teaches us to be alert to the real power of the devil. Peter warned in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, be alert and of sober mind or be clear-minded. Your enemy, like the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around, looking, around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We have a real adversary. Actually, the name devil literally is translated as adversary. We have a real adversary, an adversary whose one desire is to destroy us by destroying our faith. Peter is telling us here that this devil, this adversary, is actively prowling about, using stealth, looking for distracted, looking for sleeping victims. Let's not be his next victim. Be alert, be awake, be on your guard. Be on your guard against temptation. Be on your guard against the real power of the devil. Paul also teaches us to be on our guard against deceivers or false prophets. In Acts chapter 28, Paul is having a heart-to-heart -heart talk with the elders, the spiritual leaders of the Ephesian church. And he reminds them that for three years, he never stopped warning them to be on their guard against those who would, in his words, distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. There are false prophets. There are deceivers in the, in, in the, among, who have sown themselves among God's people. And we must be constantly aware of the truth, constantly able to identify a lie. Now, how do you do that? How can you know when something is a lie? The only way we can know if something is a lie is we have to know the truth, right? That's the only way. The only way if we can tell, that we can tell if someone is telling us something that is not true about God, about the gospel, about his word, is we must know the truth. Which means what? We must know the truth. We must get into the word, study the word, and absorb the word so that we're ready when we're tested. Be on your guard. Be on your guard against the test. Be on your guard against the real power of the devil. Be on your guard against false prophets or deceivers. And the Bible also teaches us to be on our guard, to be vigilant, to be alert, to be awake for the return of Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 25 and 13, Keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour when I will return to establish my Father's kingdom. If God allows me to live to that wondrous day, I want to be ready to welcome him. I want to celebrate and rejoice when Jesus comes back. I want to recognize that he's come, and I know you do as well. Be alert, be vigilant, be on your guard. A shield of gold. The second shield is stand firm in the faith. Stand firm in the faith. Paul, indeed, throughout the Bible, were frequently exhorted, as you know, to stand firm as believers. The word that, that Paul uses here means to be stationary or to persevere. So Paul adds to it in 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, stand firm, let nothing move you. Stand firm in the faith. Now what does he mean by the faith? 
There are two aspects to our faith. There is the objective aspect, that is, the truths of the gospel, the truths of the Bible that stand objectively outside of us. They're always true. Whether we believe them or not, or accept them or not, they're always true. That's the objective faith. We need to stand firm in that. We need to, as I've already said, we need to know it. We need to stand firm in the objective truths of the, of, of the Christian faith. But I think we all know here this morning that there is also a subjective aspect. There is the faith, and then there is living in the faith, and there is living out the faith, our experience of the faith. So I believe Paul is telling us to stand firm in both. Stand firm in the objective truth, yes, but also stand firm in the subjective truth. Uh, uh, aspect. Stand firm in your experience, living in faith, living out your faith every day. Paul warns us that we're, we're, when we're immature in our faith, when we're weak and insecure and we lack a foundation, both objectively and subjectively, he warns us in Ephesians 4 that we will be tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. We'll fall for a false gospel. We'll build our lives of faith on sand if we fail to stand firm in our faith. Paul says, be on your guard. Take that shield, be on your guard. Secondly, stand firm, stand up, know and be confident in both the objective truths and the subjective experience of your faith. The third shield is be courageous. Be courageous. Now, you may have a translation of the Bible that translates that phrase literally of its time, which is act like men. Act like men. Now, that doesn't ring so well in our ears today, does it? But it actually was an ancient, ancient idiom, which literally meant be brave or be courageous. So that's a correct translation. Be courageous. As I said, Paul talks a lot about being in spiritual battle. And it's very clear from the writings of Paul that he means for us to be in that battle. He doesn't mean for us to run from it, to hide from it. He means for us to be in the battle. And so he writes often about it. You know that famous scripture where he talks about putting on the full armor of God which will enable us, he says, to stand our ground. He talks about putting on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, fitting our feet, having the shield of faith, having the helmet of salvation. Those, of course, are all defensive things that we put on to protect us against the attacks of Satan and sin in the world, against the tests that might come into our lives. But you know that Paul, in that same scripture, offers to us an offensive weapon. And that weapon, of course, is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. A sword can be used defensively, but we generally think of it as being offensively, to go into and to slay the enemy. The pastor of Hebrews tells us that the Word of God is alive and active. I like that. You know, we think of the Word of God as a Bible, a book that we can close and open and put on our shelves. But the Word of God is so much more than that. The Word of God, the breath of God, is alive and active. And when it's applied with skill and understanding and wisdom, he says it is sharper than any double-edged sword, and it can pierce deep into our souls. But we can also use that shield to slay the devil. The sword of the Spirit. Now, I've borrowed an object for our sermon today. I'm a little uncomfortable with it. I'm almost tempted, Richard, to call you up. You may recognize this. I got it from Richard. It's a Roman sword, and it's not, like I thought, just a prop. It's actually a real heavy sword. I asked him last night if I could borrow it. So I wanted to make a point. Today, when we go to, to eesh, scares me just to look at it, actually. Today, when we go 
to battle, generally. We don't take swords. But in the past, even in World War I, for example, they were often given some type of sword for the battle. I don't know anything about swords at all. And as I said, I'm just a tad uncomfortable around them. But I'm guessing this, that when you were given a sword to go to battle, there were at least two provisions. The first is it had to be available and ready to go. When you were given the sword for battle, you didn't hide it away in the attic. You didn't put it in a box down somewhere in the basement. The sword had to be ready. It had to be ready if it was going to be useful. I love the 119th Psalm. It's a long chapter. You may know it. And in the 119th Psalm, the psalmist sings the praises of the Word of God. But the key of that, script, of that chapter is in verse 11, in which the psalmist said, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. When I read that verse, what I hear is this. I'm ready. I'm ready. I've got your word in my heart. It's in my spirit. It's in my mind. It's in my life. And when the challenge comes, when the battle must be faced, I'm ready. I'm ready. So when you're given a sword for a battle, you have to be ready. It has to be available when the enemy comes. But secondly, and just as important, you must know how to use it. I'm not even sure if I'm holding this correctly. You know, I don't know how to use it. It's not worth much if you don't know how to use it. And I'm guessing, Richard, that it takes practice and training to use this well. If I just went out onto the, the uh, uh, battlefield and I never held one before, I probably would end up cutting my own ear off, right? <laughs> Not real sharp, so I'll do that. Right? I probably wouldn't harm anybody else. You have to know how to use it. Well, I'm sure you know where I'm going with that. The Word of God must be in our hearts, but we have to know how to use it. We have to know how to apply it. How, we must know it intellectually. We must know it practically. Paul's advice to Timothy applies to every disciple. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Knowing the word and knowing how to apply it in the real world are vital for the victorious victory. My experience has been through the years that often those battles come out of the blue. Generally, the enemy doesn't call ahead and give us warning, does he? We have to be ready. We have to be trained. We have to be prepared. We want to be that kind of church here at Burnaby North where we're helping you to be ready and helping you to know how to word, use the Word of God. Now I'm going to put this down before I do cut something off. Be courageous. The fourth shield is be strong. Be strong. We talked last week about the, the tense of a word in the Greek language in which uh, Paul was writing. And this phrase, be strong, is in what's called the present imperative middle tense. So it literally could be, dis, uh, uh, literally could be spoken as strengthen yourself. Strengthen yourself, not just be strong, but strengthen yourself. And we realize that that's a frequent exhortation throughout the Bible. Paul goes and gets a little bit more specific in Ephesians 6 and 10, where he says, be strong or strengthen yourself in the Lord and in his mighty power. God is our strength and source of strength to withstand and overcome the attacks of Satan, of sin, and the trials of life in this world. And it is only and always by the power of the resurrected Christ in us that we can find victory. This, this tense suggests that we have a responsibility. 
We have a responsibility to know and to grasp that strength that is offered to us in God, in His Spirit, and in His Word. This means, among other things, that we must stay near to the source, stay plugged into God through a close, meaningful, intimate relationship with Him. In practical terms, it means to practice the spiritual disciplines of prayer, of fellowship and worship like we're doing here this morning, of reading and studying God's Word, and of practicing the gifts of the Spirit in real ways in a real world. Be strong. Strengthen yourself. But there's a fifth shield. Sometimes the Apostle Paul is accused of being a militant. He talks about putting on armor. He talks about using a sword. He talks about training for the battle. He's often been uh, accused over the years of being a militant. This qualifier here, which comes in the next verse and sums up everything uh, Paul is saying, is vitally important. Paul says the fifth shield is this. Do everything in love. Do everything in love. Paul calls us to the battle. He calls us to fight. He calls us to be victorious. But he reminds us here that the battle is fought and won, not by brute force, not by the power of this world, but only and always through the power of divine love. It is God's love that makes real and lasting change in our hearts and the hearts of others. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes in the church, we exchange this golden shield of love for the bronze shields of force and power in the world. The church has made that mistake over and over again for 2,000 years, where it's tried to use political power and the power of money and wealth and celebrity and other things to enforce the gospel, forgetting that it is love that is our power. How do we know that? How do we know that? Well, let's think about it. Consider how God ultimately defeated and destroyed our greatest enemy. Our greatest enemy is sin, the devil, and death, right? How did he do it? Was it by a brute power? Was it by cold force? He certainly could have done that. He had every right to do it that way. But he defeated our greatest enemy. He won the greatest battle for you and me through a profound and astounding act of love on a humble Roman cross. Love. Love is our power. Let's not forget that. When we find ourselves in the battle in our own lives, in the battle in society and culture, you hear today about the cultural wars, how do we win? With what do we fight? If we're Christian, it must only and always be love. Let me read to you what Paul says about that. In Romans chapter 12, Paul says, verses 9 through 21, I'm going to read just an abridged version of that. Love must be sincere. Be devoted to one another in love. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Live in harmony with one another. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do you believe that? I feel like today there's so many in the church who have lost sight of that. It is love and the goodness of love that will change the world because it is love and only love that changes hearts. If it's anything less than that, then our our religion becomes empty and cold, giving birth to moralism and pride and judgmentalism, resulting in sinful attitudes and actions allegedly for the good. This morning, Paul is offering to you and me shields of gold for the battle. 
Shields built on the principles of the Word of God and infused with the power of God and the power of His love. Let's not exchange those shields of gold for the shields of bronze in this world. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we recognize and admit here together this morning that we're in a battle, one kind or another, just about every day. A battle in our mind, a battle in our heart, a battle in our spirit. But Heavenly Father, we claim again today the victory in Christ because we know that as we stand in you, that you will fill us with the power, the power of your love, a love that changes our hearts and will change our world for your glory. Help us, Father, to use these shields to engage the battle and win for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand with us for our, our closing song, A Firm of Foundation. Jesus is indeed that firm foundation. We know that he'll never forsake us. As they say, though we might tremble on the rock, the rock never trembles under us. My prayer for you, and I hope you're praying this for me, that we will have a firm foundation in our faith, that we will be a church that provides a means in which we can have a strong foundation so that we can win in the battles. Let us pray. Dear God and Father, thank you that Jesus is our rock. Father, when the world seems to be falling apart, as it has in this last year and a half, when all things become uncertain and unsure, Lord, you have been the same. You have been our rock, and we stand by faith on you. Lord, may we build that, take the responsibility to build that foundation <clears throat> so that not only will we be strong, but so that we can win the battles for your glory and your kingdom. Lord, thank you for this time together. And be with us now as we go out. Guide our steps. Keep us in your love. Help us to stand firm in our faith. We ask in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. God bless you.